by the cars, the surface of sun, or the pollution, or people trying to swim in a river which is heavily polluted because of agrochemicals and all these things, is facing the very fact that something is changing. Together with this, climate is changing, and because we, the special animals, the mosquitoes, other elements, are moving, following the environment in which they are living normally. The warming is bringing to the cities, and it's very common nowadays in South America, you have dengue, this is the United States also, you have read that the Nile of fever came into New York because the mosquitoes all also fly with their club and they come at a right to a point and they spread out. So the increasing humidity resulting for a huge warming of the oceans. Now we learn that the oceans are becoming warm because we are able to measure, not with the tether south, but free south which move and reach 3,000 meters below the sea, is producing an amount of energy which, for instance, in the river Plate basin, the area in which I live, in the South Atlantic, the amount of energy in the sea in the last 50 years is equivalent to the amount of energy consumed in Buenos Aires for 3,600 cities like Buenos Aires for a thousand years. This means that this machine, which was working very simply with a sun sending energy and evaporating the water now has a lot more of energy because the seas are warm and these huge developments of storms, tornadoes and hurricanes are producing this effect which has the implications in human health. People living in, well I would say in the United States don't live in bad conditions, but New Orleans suffer a lot because of the Katrina and the Vilma, but in areas where there is no protection Adding to this, I would say, weather and climate problem, the fact that people is deforesting to crop is creating a series of problems which added to the increased population is bringing new spread of diseases, people moving to and fro easily, so you have cholera flying, you have Chagas disease and trypanosomiasis, you have leishmaniasis, you have dengue, malaria, you have yellow fever, spreading because the vectors are able to move into different areas. So the problem is this, and the IPCC is working in that area and is planning in regions to show to the people in different regions which are the key vulnerabilities which decision makers have to learn to analyze themselves. And what we did these days in this beautiful area was just to analyze the various problems, we have different sectors and we have nine region, eight regions and study how things may be told or tell to the decision makers to improve the conditions of the future. So the situation is that IPCC also deals with health, also deals with socioeconomic problems and also deals with the future of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. We have about 25 minutes for questions. I'd ask you to kindly introduce yourself uh, to our speakers when you pose your question. I have a couple roving microphones, don't I? Can you show me your hand? Uh, let's start with right here, please. Hello, Catherine Brayhake from The New Scientist. You've discussed the, um, the fact that for the first time the IPCC has been able to link observed climate or weather, I'll let you precise that as you wish, um, events to general trends of climate change. I'd just like to ask you how is it possible to attribute either single events, I know that's very difficult, or more importantly trends, climate trends, to climate change. How have you achieved this? The person to, uh, to give you this is uh, one of the authors, Cynthia Rosenstein, do you want to do that? She can talk to you for, well, let me, let me just, uh, while she's um, thinking about this, and if you want, we've not been linking particular weather events yet, no. Nor have we been linking, she and her team, been linking sets of weather events. 
but that is probably the next thing. Next thing. But what they have been doing is looking at uh, sets of data, let's say 29,000 of them, uh, mainly for the 1970s onwards, so they are 30-year data sets, and looking at the, the upward march of temperature, in that example I gave you, for the changes that one would expect for that. For example, in this, you know, in this part of the world, oh, I don't know, earlier, grass growing earlier, I don't put my lawnmower away at any, any time in the winter now in England. Yeah. It's going the whole year round. These sorts of things. However, you know, much more serious than that. There's a lot, masses amount of information on flowering dates, but it's over periods like that that she and others have been able to establish the re this relationship. But the up and down of particular events, much more difficult. That's another issue. Uh, at the end of this formal briefing, we will uh, make it possible to have interviews with the various authors, many of whom are here with us. Uh, we'll have one here. Hello. Ann Jolis, Dow Jones Newswires. Um, two questions. One, I know this was not uh, the working group that was supposed to prescribe um, remedies or adaptations, but could you tell us a little bit what you think um, particularly developed nations should do in terms of laws, regulations, emissions limits uh, to help curb this. And uh, second, you mentioned um, changes in cereal production uh, if, if global temperatures continue to increase. Could you tell us any other agricultural products uh, whose productivity could suffer or increase significantly due to the effects of global warming? Experts are in the room, and I uh, <laughs> hesitate to renounce upon this because they're going to come down upon me. The first part of your question, did you say developed or developing countries? What actions? What actions should... Okay. Firstly, you're quite right, we don't prescribe. The IPCC uh, keeps well away and is told to keep well away from um, recommending policies. But what we do is hopefully... Uh, assess the knowledge base that is relevant to policy. Um, if we ever make recommendations concerning the sets of actions that may, that may be useful, it would be in the field of ad adaptation. And again, the authors here uh, are, are available to talk to you about that, sets of adaptations. And if there's one set of measures, I, would have thought, I thought you said developing countries, uh, but if you did, I would say for that is to reduce, the, reduce vulnerability to weather and weather-related issues, health, uh, waterborne diseases, um, undernutrition and malnutrition that expose people uh, to issues um, such as uh, tendencies to suffer heat conditions and so on in, in hot, dry countries. If you reduce vulnerability, you achieve lots of things. You make people feel better, you reduce poverty, you give them better education, improve their health, and you improve their resilience to climate change. You do lots of things at the same time. It's something that one would want to do anyway. Isn't it? Anyway, uh, cereal yields. I talked about cereal yields, and Easterling and Agravala are their names, American and Indian, respectively, are in the room. I've seen both of them. Um, have now established a much more definite trend that in higher latitudes there is broadly an increase in cereal yields up to about two or three degrees global and then there is probably a downturn. Establishing that point and they're still uncertain about it is very important but as I said just to reinforce it at lower latitudes in semi-arid areas even small amounts of warming would tend to reduce yields. In fact, there is some evidence in our observed chapter, observed chapter, of the suggestions that yields are declining in some of these semi-arid areas and increasing. If you go to Finland and talk to forest managers, they already, they already plan for forest growth, you know, harvesting every 30 years, whereas they used to harvest every 40 years after the war. It's part of their management program. The timber's growing the timber's growing quicker. You know, we, we sort of forget this, that people who are at the sharp end of using climate-related resources like wood that needs 
temperatures to grow in Finland, um, it's all happening and it's part of the, of the product cycle and foresters have been dreaming about this.